All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Risto, and maybe some of you heard me uh, present briefly yesterday, but I am the New York Agricultural Stewardship Program Manager with American Farmland Trust. Um, so I'm gonna give you uh, my perspective on uh, using Comet Planner, although I have never really used it um, on uh, with farmers, I, I used Comet Farm. So I'm gonna give you a little bit, um, because I had enough time, um, I'm gonna share a video. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna show a video that kind of gives some background into both Comet Farm and Comet Planner. Um, and I will share my experience with Comet Farm um, a little bit, but um, fortunately Comet Planner is really uh, simple to use. And so I'm gonna give you a demonstration of that and just kind of um, go through some tips on using these, this kind of tool with, with farms. So uh, my experience with um, the Comet Farm, um, I would say you could also have the same type of use for it um, with the planner. So really, um, again, we'll get into the differences, but um, you know, the main difference is just the simplicity of the planner. It's very, um, it's very easy to use and quick. So, um, but where I used the, the Comet tool was with the demonstration farm network in the Genesee River watershed. So uh, this is a network of several farms in the watershed um, in New York where we're highlighting um, them because of their successful soil health implementation. And so uh, we picked them because of that, they have a history of that. Uh, the, the main purpose is to learn about changes in economic benefits and costs from their real life experiences. And so those were told through the case studies that um, we heard about yesterday. Um, but they also have their own uh, observed changes, things that we haven't measured, um, like erosion and water runoff and infiltration and just in, easier to manage the soil. Um, and one, of, one thing about these farmers is that they've already learned how to integrate a lot of these practices into their current system. And so we're showing um, neighboring farmers, farmers that are interested in, in starting, that this can be done and this is how these folks are doing it. And by having more farms, you have more situations uh, for them to learn from and mentors basically. Um, and that's what they're doing. They're sharing technology information and the lessons learned with, with stakeholders. So folks like us, folks like the other farmers. Um, and so we're highlighting these farms to then uh, use them as examples to tell stories. And, and some of that, it was the economics, but the other piece was the environmental uh, analysis and, and which includes the greenhouse gas through Comet Farm. And so this is just uh, showing you where these farms are. So um, to the left here, we're in Western New York in the Genesee River watershed. And we have these farms, these red circles are the farms that were in the case study. Um, we actually have a fourth one over here to the, far right that will be out. Well, it's out now, but um, it wasn't part of this original series that Michelle um, developed. And so you did yesterday hear about this, the stories. And so I'm just reminding you all about the case study. So I, we, I authored the three, co-authored the three on the right there. And, and so these stories were used to, to talk about their journey. Um, and so the front part of that is really giving the background to the farm. And then the back has that economic piece that we heard about. But there's also one sentence in these case studies that talk about the environmental benefits. And so part of that is the water quality. But there's also a sentence in there about, about the uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions. And so, um, again, we're just highlighting these farmers and, and using Comet, the Comet tool as a way to show the environmental benefits. And that may be interesting to farmers. I, I think in reality, it's more interesting to folks like us or policymakers or uh, landowners who might be renting their land to a farmer. Um, but nonetheless, that information is in the story and this is how we're using this information. And again, you heard a little bit about this yesterday, so I'm not gonna go into too much, but we did the nutrient tracking tool which is a water quality tool. And so that's a USDA model. Um, it has similar inputs as Comet Farm, um, but it is a simpler tool to use than Comet Farm. Um, and you can find out more about that. And then of course we use the Comet Farm tool. Um, and I'm gonna show you this video here soon. So I'm not gonna go into too much here, but this was the other environmental piece was Comet Farm 
a Comet planner. Um, and um, I will say that Comet Farm is has included uh, the nutrient tracking tool. They've integrated that into their model. So in the future, it's still in development. But in the very near future, you'll be able to get both water quality and greenhouse gas uh, information from the Comet Farm. Um, I used it in the development mode, and it seemed to work pretty well. Because a lot of the inputs are the same. And so you're kind of entering things twice. And this way, it helps to just reduce that time. So again, you heard about the amazing uh, team that Michelle put together to review these case studies. And we did have um, some Comet Farm reviewers to review all the data. And so these people could be resources to you, Matt and Mark and Haley, especially Haley I worked a lot with um, in more recent times um, to just kind of work through how to, you know, what these results mean, how to look at the results. Um, they do have staff um, there to help with that. And just to show you the, the results from my three farms. Um, so we had the water quality piece and you, there were reductions here. Um, I did mention yesterday that New York does have uh, relatively smaller fields. Um, and so on the three farms that I did, you know, you're looking at specific field data with Comet Farm. Um, and so we had this range between 10 and 25 acres for the three farms. I mean, the average size was 16 acres. Um, and then we had this range of 69 to 476% um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, uh, and that was a weighted average um, based on the size of the field. And that was a reduction of four cars off the road. The lower percentage, one of the farms was already doing a ton of stuff. They were an organic dairy. They already had these perennial uh, cover on their farm. Um, and they were, so they didn't have a lot of changes from their soil health. And so that brought that average down just with the three farms as a sample size. And yeah, so here's what we had for the climate story there. And just to remind you, again, you saw this yesterday, Michelle kind of briefly touched on it. Maybe you've seen it in other presentations, but um, as with the economics, we saw um, paying for, <clears throat> I'm sorry, doing things like reduced tillage, where you save so much money from labor and wear and tear and machinery and, and um, fuel, you know, that money gets reinvested in some of these practices. So they have money available to then um, do the, mo the more costly things, which could be cover crops or some nutrient management. Um, and overall, though, the systems approach allows for this balancing of the of their ledger so that, um, you know, combining practices, you know, doing no till will pay for um, offset other costs. Well, we also promote a systems approach for for um, soil health, but also looking at climate mitigation and, and resiliency, because doing these practices together you're going to basically, when you look at the years versus the organic matter, which is which is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil, you're gonna get what where you wanna be faster and at a higher level by combining practices. And that's what this slide is showing. And so that's, that's something to promote is doing these things together just because of the, the way um, you're, you're having this additive effect to, um, to get the results that, that we're looking for. So uh, I, I like this slide a lot because it does kind of show what we're talking about. And so we always do hear about cover crops, but really they should be called root crops because of what is going on underground when you, when you use cover crops, when you plant cover crops in the soil. And you know, you, you see this large root mass and that's, that's pulling again, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and, and bringing it into the soil. Um, and sto soil stores two to three times more CO2 than the atmosphere and two to five times more than vegetation. And you can kind of see based on these illustrations, like what's going on here. Um, and so, so that's, um, that's what's happening when, when we're doing some of these practices is, is you're basically um, developing this root structures that, that um, are storing this carbon. Um, so I took this slide from um, the um, Soil Health Institute. They have a lot of resources if you're looking into some things. And 
uh, these are potential target areas for greenhouse gas capture. So there are 29 recognized and funded USDA um, NRCS practices for reducing carbon emissions. Um, I think that they picked the top four here of their potential and um, in, in different ways. So there's potential in a couple of ways. One is just the capacity. So you see that from the millions of acres um, that are available in the US and then also where the current adoption is. And so when you're out there looking around, talking to farmers, um, you know, this is kind of a, a high level 30,000 foot scale looking at kind of like overall where should we focus? But, you know, these have a lot of potential both in their capacity with acreage and also um, at their level of adoption of adoption percentage. So there is a lot of room for improvement here on these things. Um, and so kind of think about, you know, we have just limited funding, limited time, same with the farmers. So where are we going to focus our effort? And these, these are good practices to consider um, at the top of the list. So now I'm going to do my best to play uh, this video. So it, you know, I putting this together, I, I haven't presented on Comet before. Um, so I wasn't sure exactly the best way to do it under this kind of format, but I decided Rather than me making slides of Comet, I would just let them do their slideshow. Um, and so I do apologize for playing a video of a presentation, but I couldn't really think of a better way to do it. Um, I'm going to let the people who developed it and, and use it, or I'm sorry, and um, develop it and, and run it and train people, I think that they can speak better on it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give that a shot. So this is about it's about a 17 minute video, but I'm not going to show the whole thing because part of it is demonstrating Comet uh, Planner and I'm going to give you a, so hold on to your seats because I'm going to give you a live demonstration of Comet Planner. Um, so stick with me here. So I hope you can see now you can see this, the, the YouTube screen, Chris. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and play it. Haley Nagel and I'm an outreach and education specialist at Colorado State University at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab. I work in the research group led by Dr. Keith Paschen. I am presenting today on behalf of my team that is shown on the left side of this slide, and we want to extend a special thanks to NRCS and the Climate Change Office at USDA for their continued support for the development and the use of Comet tools. Additional support and funding comes from a number of smaller state agencies and private donors. A brief history of the tools. The talk about recording and quantifying greenhouse gas emissions began with the Voluntary Greenhouse Gas Reporting Act in 1992 in an effort for farmers and ranchers to have a recording of their greenhouse gas emissions. The IPCC developed these methods in 1997 and for the first time, farmers and ranchers could do just that. The first tools began on Excel and were later upgraded to databases and in 2006, Comet VR was released and offered a metadata analysis for soil organic carbon stock changes in response to tillage. Later in 2012, an initiative involving the USDA Climate Change Office and NRCS began to take things beyond the IPCC methods for more specific emissions, prompting conversations about understanding the impacts of conservation methods on greenhouse gas balance within agriculture, and seeing the benefit of modifying management practices. What we call the Blue Book Methods document, which you'll see in a few slides, or USDA's Quantifying Greenhouse Gas Fluxes in Agriculture and Forestry, was created in parallel with Comet Farm. So who's using Comet Farm? As of June 10th, 2020, more than 13,000 users have created over 24,000 projects using the Comet tools. This includes NRCS field offices, regional conservation districts, farmers and ranchers, education sectors, businesses, scientists, and NGOs. Both the Comet Farm and Comet Planner tools are web-based greenhouse gas inventory tools for land-based systems and are designed for conservation scenario analyses. Users can access these tools through the URLs mentioned on this slide, comet-planner.com and comet-farm.com. The Comet Farm tool is a modeling platform that implements the USDA sanctioned methods and models mentioned in that blue book. In 2017-2018, the planner tool was created as a simpler tool for regional assessments to visualize general benefits at the regional scale. We will dive deeper into those differences throughout this slide. A brief introduction into greenhouse gas accounting within agriculture. 
if we focus on the top level of soil within a system. An increase in organic matter by just 1% on 160 acres of soil type of silt loam is the equivalent of about 900 metric tons of CO2 emissions. To put this into context, this is about the same as removing emissions from 190 passenger vehicles for just one year, which is about the same emissions as one passenger vehicle driving 2.2 million miles in a year, or removing the emissions related to 100,000 gallons of gasoline consumed. Comatool is designed to do an entire greenhouse gas inventory within an entity with a focus on three main greenhouse gases associated with agriculture, carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O. This infographic was created by a colleague of mine, Amy Swan, as an introduction into the 2007 IPCC assessment. Within the diagram, you can see various sources and sinks of each of these gases indicated by the arrows. For example, livestock plays a critical role in release of methane into the atmosphere through direct emissions from livestock belches and the decomposition of their manure. Methane is also released when growing rice through anoxic decomposition of organic matter in rice paddies. Sources of nitrous oxide include application of synthetic fertilizers and manure decomposition. Carbon also cycles through the soil system either through sequestration or removal from or loss to the atmosphere. Biotic or living components within an entity also play a key role in carbon cycling through the system through processes such as accumulation of biomass in what is harvested or left as residue, or maintaining living roots within the soil. The diagram demonstrates a simplified version of the elemental cycles within a farm. Each of these sources and subsource emissions are identified in a common balance sheet expressed in a CO2 equivalent as results in Comet Farm. The Comet Farm tool is a modeling platform that implements more than 40 different USDA sanctioned methods and models. It implements a set of computer models that simulate all greenhouse gas emissions that have been emitted within a defined entity, from manure to fertilizer application to burning and other management practices. Soil related emissions are calculated through the DACENT model. Accounting for animal agriculture is also available and different livestock have different empirical models associated with each of them as well as forestry and agroforestry systems. The data collected is unique to each individual entity, and to make it as user-friendly as possible, the data is collected comprehensively once and used to drive all the different models necessary. Again, all of these methods are defined in the USDA's Quantifying Greenhouse Gas Fluxes in Agriculture document, which is available for public on USDA's site. To break it down even simpler, the tools are built around a conservation scenario analysis. Comet Farm gives users the ability to input historical management practices and baseline data, so what you would like to compare your new practices to, and then superimposes potential conservation practices to compare the benefits relative to the baseline. While Comet Planner also compares potential conservation practices to a baseline, Planner pulls from regional averages for broad description of conservation benefits. To compare Comet Farm and Comet Planner tools in more detail, Comet Farm allows for flexible farm to field specific accounting. Users have the ability to set management practices in an almost infinite number of ways and compare the benefits against the baseline on the same balance sheet. Planner tool is fast, easy to use with only four clicks to your results and a good introduction to determining impacts of conservation practices. Comet Planner tool, however, has a fixed baseline for what is typical farming practices within a given region, and then provides meta-model results of Comet Farm model runs completed at a regional level. These regional averages are developed based on USDA's major land resource areas. The conservation practices are defined by NRCS and include practices that are tied directly to soil greenhouse gas emissions or those that have a biomass impact. Comet Farm tools are a nexus for greenhouse gas mitigation in agriculture, from state to federal level programs and private carbon markets, but also carbon registries and supply chain initiatives using our tools. To dive a little deeper into the Comet Farm tool, the DACENT model, which is outlined in the USDA Blue Book mentioned before, runs simulations about how crops are grown and about how nitrogen and carbon cycle through the soil and ecosystem. The model simulates how crops are harvested, 
how crop residue decomposes, and how carbon fluctuates between different sources and sinks as a result of physical properties of the soil like temperature and moisture. Information driving these models comes from a data set developed from peer review studies from over 200 sites going back 170 years and is maintained by universities and private corporations. An overview of the Comet Farm tool, some of the common soil conservation practices are simple but can lead to a large carbon benefits. For example, reducing tillage or adding cover crops has cascading impacts on emissions through reducing soil disturbance or maintaining living roots within the soil. Users provide information about specific management practices in their location, and this information is used in combination with historical practices, along with the climate and soil data from PRISM and Sergo. This, combined with the number of USDA methods and equations from the Blue Book mentioned before, drive the DACENT model. This generates outputs which are returned to the user as a result demonstrated in the tabular or graphical report in the right hand side. First, a user selects the area in question either by drawing the parcel as a polygon of points or adding a plot of land by entering a point and defining the acreage. The yellow lines within the map demonstrate the various map units associated with soil types within the region. Once the location of the entity is selected, the user is asked to describe the historical management practices from before 2000. Then the user describes how they farm the ground now, including crop rotations, fertilizers, irrigation, or any practice that has an impact on the soil, something that stimulates plant growth or soil disturbance. Tillage is going to be one of the most significant for soil disturbances. The drag and drop feature allows users to create a crop rotation with some of the more common crops, based on USDA databases on fertilizer use, average crop planting date, and average crop harvest date by that specific region. However, there is a drop-down bar within the tool that also allows the users to select from more than 80 different crops. The user will then implement a future scenario where they can make a simple management change. For example, if reduction in tillage is selected as a management practice, this could lead to less disturbance in the soil, allowing for the soil to stabilize and accumulate more soil carbon. Additionally, more scenarios can be compared if you were to add a different soil management practice. More conservation practices are available depending on what is inputted into the baseline. Then the tool executes the models and allows users to see how their practice changes can impact carbon and nitrogen in their field. While different practices impact different greenhouse gas fluxes, the results are simplified in terms of metric tons of CO2 equivalent. The DACENT model, which is the principal model used to estimate the change in soil organic matter and carbon, allows users to see this change. If you recall back to the system model of greenhouse gas fluxes, indicated in the upper right corner, each category and subsource category on the results page is associated with each arrow. When you extend the greenhouse gas categories into subsource categories, for example N2O into direct versus indirect sources, a confidence interval is shown around the estimate. Using the Monte Carlo simulation methods, the confidence interval portrayed shows that there is a 90% likelihood that the results fall between the upper and lower bounds, 5% chance that it could be as low as the number on the left, or 5% chance that it could be as high as the number on the right. The Comet Farm API allows for programmatic scripting or a side door entrance to the Comet Farm modeling tool. The API allows for a more extensive regional cropland simulations to be run through the model. It is run through the Google Cloud and the API utilizes an XML input and output files, which will be shown on the following slides. Use of the API is generally free for limited use and for USDA sponsored projects. Large analysis requires us to charge a fee to run the API through the cloud, including a licensing fee and a small cost for each Comet model run in this manner. The Comet Farm API inputs viewed on the XML input file will match what users view on the graphical interface. Additionally, the Comet Farm API outputs viewed on the XML output file will also match what users view on the graphical interface. While the API and the graphical user interface are both run through the Comet Farm modeling platform, use of the API is better suited for regional to national level analyses. The API also allows for rapid bulk processing. The graphical user interface, however, is more suited for farm-level analysis and has the ability for quick scenario comparisons. To 
to look deeper into the Comet Planner tool. As mentioned at the beginning, the idea behind the Comet Planner tool was to create a tool that was simple, easy to use, and could demonstrate the relative benefits of the NRCS conservation practices within a given region against the baseline data. For the Comet Planner tool, random cropland and grassland points were identified within each of the approximate 230 different agricultural regions in the country, defined by the NRCS as Major Land Resource Areas, or MLRAs. Crop rotations for each were constructed from the USDA NASS cropland data layer back in 2008 in every region of the country. Additional survey data, like average fertilizer rates for crops by state and average crop planting and harvest data for each state were added, thus becoming the baseline for the modeling analysis. On each data point, baseline and conservation scenarios were then modeled in Comet Farm system using soil, weather, and historical management specific to each point and location. The difference in emissions is presented in a tabular report that can be downloaded. The numbers presented in the table are an average of all of those different points within an ecoregion. When you select a county, you are tying the county to a major land resource area. The point level soil carbon stock and greenhouse gas emission changes modeled in Comet Farm were averaged to the regions to provide an average regional impact of conservation practice adoption. The Comet Planner tool generates scenario estimates for 34 NRCS conservation practice standards within the contiguous US and Hawaii. So, um, so yeah, there was a lot of Comet Farm in that video, I, I, I acknowledge, but the reason why I thought that was important was because um, the Comet Planner is basically running a lot of that in the background, a lot of, of, of the modeling is done through the, the, the framework of farmer. And so, yes, that was a lot of detail. You guys may never need to know that, um, when, especially talking to a farmer, but I just wanted you to have, to, to know that there was a lot of research and a lot of thought behind this tool um, and that the planner is running kind of on top of the, the farmer um, framework. Um, so, but, um, so, but the, the thing about the planner is that it, it you, you, they didn't, they skipped over a lot. It was uh, interesting to watch it again because uh, the, the farmer tool has a lot of inputs and you will now see with the planner. So you can just go to cometplanner.com. I just did this yesterday. I didn't have to create an account or log in or anything and it just popped right up. So if go to Comet Planner um, and then there's just a, a few steps. You can see right here, there's four steps. Um, and so I picked uh, Swedes Farm because I did do, so one, I talked about Swede yesterday. Uh, secondly, I did a Comet Farm analysis. So I wanted to kind of compare the results. Um, and um, anyway, so I picked Swede Farm. So the first step here is just, you need to name the project, right? So I called it Swede Farm, very creative. Uh, I, uh, he's in New York State, and in this field happens to be in Livingston County. So you want to make sure you get it, get where the field is that you're looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is Livingston County, he, even though his farmstead is actually in a different county. So just make sure you have that part right, because this planner is looking at the average of that county's data. Uh, the next step is select a class of conservation practices that best describe the practice you would like to evaluate. So in, in Farmer, you're kind of picking these practices yourself, um, but in Planner, it, it takes just kind of an assumed suite of practices based on what type of farm you're dealing with. And so you do need to know that up front. So um, in most of our cases, I would imagine um, that we would be dealing with cropland management. That's what Sweet is, so I picked that. And I'm not gonna click on this one too much because I, I don't wanna mess with the results in a live um, demonstration, but that's the third step is you're just selecting the practices that best describe your system. And so these are pre-filled in, these options are pre-filled based on um, your choice in step two. So if you picked a different choice, a different one I'm, comes up. So see here, this has um, 
different ones that will come up. There might be overlap, but the suite that they're gonna get, let you choose from is gonna be different. So back to cropland management. Um, and then um, I just wanna make sure I didn't mess that up. I didn't, okay, so step three. Um, so then you wanna pick, so um, in my case, Swede was a retroactive analysis where he had already been doing these things for years. So I knew which particular practices to pick, but uh, you may be working with a farmer that, um, or a landowner that is like, what would, it, what would happen if we picked cover crops? What would happen if we picked no-till or reduced tillage or in, in, it started with nutrient management? What is gonna be those benefits? So either way, planner does not distinguish between retroactive or, uh, or proactive. Um, it, it's just gonna give you the re reductions from each practice based on all that data that they went through in the video. So, um, so I picked the, the three from Swedes Farm, which was, so when you click on one, so he had cover crop, right? So then you go over here and you look at, you know, uh, the best option for that farm. So I have non-irrigated cropland so that I had to look at those two. So I'm down to these two. So either non-legume or legume. And, you know, of course, nothing's ever that simple. Like Swede would use, let's say a mix. So there might be a mix. So you just kind of pick the best one. Maybe you want to see the most, the best results. So you might pick a leguminous or, you know, anyway, this is limited. So you just pick the one that best suits the situation or at least you explain to the farmer or landowner that here are the limitations to this. Um, so I selected the ones that best fit Swedes farm. And this is instantaneous. So when you click on these, I'm not gonna do it like a six, I don't wanna mess up my demonstration, but as you click these, they pop in down here. And if you click one accidentally, you can just hit delete and it'll go away. So then um, enter the acreage associated with each conservation practice. So it's the 25 acre field. So you just enter the, for in my case, the 25 acres on each one of these practices. Um, and then it automatically, as you enter the acreage, this, this I feel comfortable with uh, changing, but as you enter the acreage, you can see it instantaneously um, shows you the results right down here. So I'm gonna go back to 25. Um, and so you can see it's, it's changing and in a positive number in the bottom, is is the reduction. So this is a total of 13 CO2 um, equivalents. Um, so then, um, then you click download the, the results and it pops up this page. And so you can get, I mean, it looks very similar, right? But this is a PDF handout that you could share or save in your files. Um, and so when you look at it's, it's crediting uh, tillage, uh, reduced tillage, cover crops and nutrient management. Um, at different levels. And uh, so you get this 13 CO2 equivalents. So then what you can do with that number, so what does that even mean? I, like that has, has very little meaning to me. Um, so the EPA has a greenhouse gas equivalents calculator. Um, and so I, um, I should share this in the slide. So I will do that before I upload them. Uh, but anyway, so you could just also type in EPA the greenhouse gas equivalency calculator, and you'll get this website come up. And so it, it defaults to if you have energy data. So you have to look down to if I have emissions data, and that's what we have. So you, I typed in 13 of the CO2 equivalent. Um, and so, and yeah, but there's other options, but with the Comet Farm or Comet Planner, it's this top one, right? So I typed in 13, I hit calculate, and that equals nearly three passenger vehicles driven for one year or 32,000 miles driven. There's all these different ways. And they showed this in the video too of, of gallons of gasoline consumed. There's all these different ways of uh, expressing um, that number, that value, right? So in our case studies, we chose passenger vehicles because people can relate to that, I think quite well. Um, you know, but it's like 1.6 worth of energy use for a home in one year like that, I think is also an interesting way to express it. So you can express, uh, choose your way to express what that 13 uh, equates to. Um, so that one 25 acre field by doing these practices, it's basically offsetting a home's energy use for the year. 
So I don't know. I find that interesting. Um, but pick whatever one um, resonates with you. Um, and so that's um, basically it for the demonstration part. So I was going to go back to my presentation and wrap up, and then we can have some questions. For more information on quantification methods and summary of each NRCS conservation practice standard used in planning, users can refer to the Comet Planner report found at the bottom of the Planner Project page. For a tool demonstration, I would like to refer you to the Comet Farm URL, comet-farm.com. Within this site, you can locate the current tutorials under the help icon in the top right corner. Within this page, you can navigate to several YouTube tutorials that can walk you through demonstration projects using Comet Farm. PDF tutorials are also available, and we will be working this summer to update existing help materials. Upon entering the Comet Farm or Planner site, a pop-up indicating the most recent updates to the tool will be shown. Further updates to come this year include auto-building baseline data through satellite imagery, additional conservation practices, and API improvements. A new help desk ticketing system will also be added to the page to submit inquiries, and webinars for Comet Farm and Comet Planner will be available in the fall. If you would like to request a training for now, you can contact me at haley.nagel at colostate.edu. The one thing I did want to show you is um, we did run the Comet Farm tool and got an output um, to, to make that comparison for our case study. Um, and then I downloaded that report that I just showed you for Swede. And so just, I was curious to see what the results were. And basically, so Comet Farm took me 25 hours to do Swede's um, case study. So that was a lot of inputs. That include, doesn't include the two hours of the farmer's time to do the information going back 20 years. And I got this 13 uh, CO2 uh, equivalents, right, based on all that time in the Comet Farm. And so 13.1. And with Comet Planner, which you saw, it took four clicks. Um, I also got 13. So I want you guys to feel confident using the planner. I also saw Haley give a demonstration on another farm, totally different farm, random farm. It was within a couple, right? It was like a couple of CO2 equivalents. And that was when they were in the upper 20s, lower 30s. And so there was a couple of, instead of 28, it was 27 or 31 or something, right? So again, overall, it wasn't a big difference. So I would feel confident using the planner. And I just wanted you to, to know that because the, the, the farm is tended to be thought of as this like gold standard, but I think using the planner is going to get you very close. Um, and I will also have the tips here. Um, although this was more for developing case studies and since we're running out of time, um, you know, I'll end it with that. And these will be up on the website once I uh, upload this to the resources. So, um, thank you.